Hey everybody, it's Shadow Star here, and it is finally, finally time for me to review the Gen 4 Pokemon anime. And oh boy, was it a big one. The Sinnoh anime, for those who don't know, is the longest generation there is, as it is four seasons long. That is over two, that is almost 200 episodes, and surprisingly, it's not as much filler as I remember it to be. There was decent amounts of filler here and there, but for the most part, there was still a lot they crammed into it, so I'm impressed, but they put a lot into it, but even the stuff they put in sometimes felt like filler when it wasn't, but let's just get rolling, shall we? We're gonna start, let's start off by talking about the new character, Dawn. And the thing you'll notice straight away is the ep the series really sets up Dawn as being a major protagonist because for the first episode it's entirely from her perspective. You don't even see Ash until the end of the episode so it really makes you feel like you're watching a whole new show about Dawn at first and I really enjoyed that fresh take but they really set up a lot of things from the beginning. Dawn at the beginning is such a great character because like I said it feels like you're starting a whole new journey it feels like you're starting a whole new show and Dawn's a new character so it just felt great to see her be a trainer starting off and see where she goes but I've never been that big of a fan of Dawn and I'm still not she's all right but she did have some good moments and I remembered liking her at the beginning like I said they set up good things at at immediately at the beginning with even having foreshadowing such as when she's at Lake um, Lake Verity and sees Mesprit. It seems like it's just going to be a parallel to Ash seeing ho -Oh, but it actually ties in way later to the plot so they thought that one through way ahead but Dawn's Pokemon are where we start talking. Piplup? Honestly? I find Piplup annoying. I've never liked Dawn's Piplup. It's annoying, it's overconfident, it's not that exciting to watch in a contest battle, it's just Piplup, what can you say? It's annoying, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't do anything, it cries, it gets arrogant, it complains, it doesn't do anything. But then you've got Baneri, again, Baneri was alright, it's cute, it has some good battle moments with Ice Beam, but it doesn't feel nearly as memory memorable as Pokemon say like Skiddy, so it just kind of becomes forgotten later on and all the Pokemon kind of blend together. The one I do remember is Pachirisu, mainly because Pachirisu is adorable, but at least that one was more fun to watch with his electric attacks in battle. And it gave, and well, Pachirisu was used a bit more better in contests such as having the ice chandelier. So, you know, Dawn actually had quite a few contest moves that were combinations and so on, and they treated contests a lot more seriously with a lot more effort put into them this season, I will give you that. But then we have something interesting. As we said at the beginning of at the end of Battle Frontier, Ash caught an Apom that seemed to love contests. And while Ash did use Apom for a decent amount at the beginning of this journey, it was soon traded away to Dawn. And you thought, oh, this is going to be great. We're finally going to see Apom in contests. No, Apom immediately evolves and does maybe two contests at Ampipom before being traded away to go play ping pong for no apparent reason. And he's never seen again. You know, a Pokemon that Ash caught and you thought would be a major Pokemon at the beginning of this series is just forgotten. It's just one of the stupidest, most annoying releases of a Pokemon. And then we have Swinub. It's a Pokemon which quickly evolved into a Pulse Swine and Mammoth Swine, immediately started disobeying, it basically became Charizard, and then it became finally used in contests for things like Ice Chandelier and Flame Ice, which was cool and led to a few interesting moments, but other than that, Mamoswine, I can't think of memorable moments. Honestly, none of Dawn's Pokemon stand out. Her Cyndaquil, which she got from Lyra, I can't remember a single time it had a cool battle, except maybe Flame Ice in the Grand Festival. Then you get Togekiss, a Pokemon she got way too late into the adventure, which its only gimmick was it can swat away Draco Meteor, whoop de doo But other than that, it didn't really do much because it was gotten after she already had five ribbons, so we didn't really need to see it. 
A good compliment I will give to Sino, and a compliment I've given to all these generations, is once again the background music being used and background music being music we've heard from the games. Once again, great music, gotta love it. The Sino series sets up a lot of characters. Some of them come back a lot, some of them not so much. We've got Professor Rowan, and he's by far the most forgettable professor so far. I feel like Birch and even Elm was used a bit more. Professor Rowan only really showed up once, maybe during the Galactic stuff. I guess he was in the Summer Academy, but God, he's just so forgettable. But people who did have a huge step up is Team Rocket. Well... Okay, mainly Jessie. Jessie's contests were vastly improved. Sure, she had cool contest routines before, but now her contest routines are way better. She sticks with one consistent character and she wins ribbons. This, to me, is huge. I remember when I was a kid, my mind was blown that Jessie was actually winning ribbons and it was real. Honestly, you know, I know May and Dawn are the protagonists, but Jessie is the one I got. you get so excited for when she wins a ribbon, when she gets to the Grand Festival. And my only disappointment is that she got, she didn't get the time to shine in the Grand Festival. They treated her like a joke at the end, despite the fact that she's just such a good character. There were plenty of good performances. I loved the first time she finally won a ribbon. She beat Kenny, and James beat... Dawn, that one time when James pretend, pretended to be Jesse, so there were a lot of good things. The only downside is there are two times where she wins a ribbon and it's not treated so well because they just kind of, it's off to the side while Ash is doing a gym or they're having a filler episode and she's winning a ribbon. Why is she second class in what is otherwise a filler episode? But one interesting moment is the episode where Dawn meets a princess who looks like her and they swap places because she wants to be in a contest. Sounds reasonable, right? Wrong. Remember, at this, while it sounds nice because she wants to participate, the princess, Dawn has already won five ribbons. So, remember, everyone else doesn't think it's a princess. She, everyone else still sees Dawn and thinks it's Dawn. So, rightly so, Jessie and other coordinators would be annoyed and say, hey, why is Dawn participating when she's got five ribbons and Jessie needs her fifth ribbon? She steals the ribbon from her. Yes, she gets given it to her for second place, but still, what they should have done, which... This would have given you the same result, but still been gr just as good, is in that episode, what should have happened is, Jesse should have beat the princess. Then, you get the idea that Jesse can think she's beaten Dawn, but Dawn hasn't actually been de beaten by Jesse, because it wasn't actually her. And then the princess, princess, so Jessie still gets her ribbon, she gets a moment on time on stage to shine when she gets her fifth ribbon, and then the princess can say, oh Dawn, I think my Togekiss still needs training, here, you take it, same outcome, but a better result. So, a character which, once again, doesn't do much until the very end, is Brock. Honestly, he just shows up out of nowhere when he returns to beginning, and he doesn't do much. He gets a crow gunk, which basically replaces Misty and Max as the as the one who attacks him when, when he's around a nurse Joy or something. But other than that, his bonsai falls into Sudoburo, and then it becomes forgettable. He has Hapini, which its running joke is that it can lift stuff, but I suppose it's mostly there as foreshadowing because when it finally evolves. It's here because Brock's ultimate dream will be to be a doctor, not a breeder, and that's why Brock leaves. This series is the end of Brock, and like I said, Brock, I got nothing against him, but he adds nothing to the team, and although that being said, it's a shame, because Brock is finally gone after 12 seasons in, Brock will be finally gone, but... He didn't have many other moments. I suppose the only other thing is he did have a connection to Yuxi, and his Krogunk had a rivalry with Toxicroak. But let's finally talk about Ash. Ash is far more competent than he's ever been. To me, this is Ash at his best. He has strategies, he has challenges, he takes advice, he learns routines like counter, shield, he has great rivals with Paul, many amazing battles, he loses a few times with other things, 
But all in all, this is Ash thinking at his best with some of his best team. He's got a Starly, which didn't do much. It was a generic bird. It participated in a Poke Ring competition. It wins, it evolves, yada, yada, yada. Honestly, Staravia, you're the forgettable team member. Then you've got the slow Turtwig. Turtwig started off as a great team member, although it seemed a bit like Bulbasaur, since it came from a similar upbringing. But once it evolved, it became slow and didn't really win any battles. Buizel, on the other hand, is my favourite. Now, Buizel was technically originally Dawn's, but it was traded, as I said, with Apom. And Buizel is easily one of my favourite team members of Ash, mainly because I just like Buizels. I like Buizel, he's a great attacker, he's fun to see in battle, he has some really good battles, like a battle against Lucario and a lot of other great battles. Honestly, they give a lot of really good battles to Buizel more than anyone. Then you've got other ones, like... Gliscor, who, again, didn't have too many good battles to the Pokemon League, even though he should have been a better team member, but he spent a decent amount training away. A bit like Charizard, except he's not nearly as exciting as Charizard, so who cares? <laughs> then you've got his Gibble, a Pokemon which was gotten so late, it barely does anything other than a running gag where it can't learn a Draco Meteor until the very end, where it became a powerhouse in the Pokemon League and actually had some good battles against Conway, but other than that, Gibble didn't do much other than have that one running joke. But all in all, his team was still had better focus than some of his other team. I'd say it's the only other team which came close is maybe the Hoenn team, but still, this was Ash's best team. But what made Ash so good is his rivals. Well, mainly one rival. You can't talk about Sinnoh without talking about Paul. Paul is obviously Ash's best rival. There is no denying it. Paul is a trainer who catches strong Pokemon, only takes what he likes, releases Pokemon, and thanks to Paul we get an interesting tidbit about the animation. So normally, if you catch or return a Pokemon, the, it's red. If you were sending out a Pokemon, it's white. But have you ever noticed when releasing a Pokemon, it is blue? Meaning there is a specific function when you're trying to release a Pokemon. It's just a cool tidbit. But Paul... He's a great character. He comes off as arrogant, but what I like is the little hidden moments. You can see he actually does respect to certain characters. He has respect for characters like Thin Cynthia, Brandon, and even Brock, but he definitely doesn't respect Ash or Barry or other ca characters. He has plenty of good moments, or well, plenty of moments that we remember. His first battle with Ash, the Heart Home competition, the Lake Acuity battle, the Pokemon League, Paul is a rival they constantly reference and constantly bring back. Unlike other rivals, like Gary, who was barely shown, or other rivals who take too long to show up, Paul is somebody who, even if he's not there, his presence is always felt, because Ash will often mention him, and you really feel the rivalry between them. So... Easily, Paul's the best rival, and as we said, we have Paul's Chimchar. Chimchar was originally Paul's until it was released and given to Ash. And with Chimchar comes this whole arc where it can learn Blaze, and Ash can be can't learn to handle it, Paul can't handle it until he finally does, and it evolves. And honestly, I suppose, you know, Chimchar is the Pokemon which is supposed to symbolize their rivalry, showing how Ash is able to perfect Chimchar where Paul couldn't, but that doesn't mean Paul's not a good trainer, because Paul can destroy almost anyone, and it was just barely that Paul lost to Ash in the Pokemon League. Speaking of other rivals, we have Nando, a rival for both Dawn and Ash, although he never felt like it for either. He disappears about a quarter into the anime and doesn't show up again until the Grand Festival and Pokemon League. He has some cool routines because he likes to use sing and music, but other than that, I suppose the only cool idea is that you get to see him in the Grand Festival and in the Pokemon League. But other than that, yeah, there's not much to say. One thing that really, really annoyed me, and I didn't do it all the time, is sometimes in Diamond and Pearl, they do this thing where the episode opens by showing a random scene that happens in the middle of the episode, then the credits play, and then the episode begins proper. 
I don't care for this. It's always stupid. It always spoils an exciting moment when you just rather watch the episode. You don't need to show me what's coming up. I don't need a trailer for what's happening in the episode I'm about to watch. It's so annoying. It's so stupid. So, you f if you think we had good rivals, we had great villains. We have Hunter J and Team Galactic. Hunter J being one of the most ruthless villains who always feels like a th threat when she's around. She has no hesitation trying to kill off her team members or burn down a forest or do anything to reach her goal. She fought for Riolu, some shield on, the Regis. She's not afraid to get anything she wants and has one of the most climactic and exciting moments in the show when she works with Team Galactic. Team Galactic, again, way better than Team Magma and Aqua because they were set up and shown multiple times in Eterna City, to Solosian Ruins, they showed up every time and if you pay attention, they actually are building slowly towards their goal. You know, in Solosian Ruins, they might be trying to find a spear key, then they grab the meteors from, um, twi um, Valstone City, they have a great dynamic because you've got Krogunk and its rivalry with Toxicroak, you've got the setup of Cyrus pretending to be a good, eye, good guy, they do evil things like try and blow up Iron Island, we get introduced to Looker because of them, and it leads to a great climactic arc where everyone is working to stop them. You've got Team Rocket, Gary, e Professor Rowan, the heroes, they're all working to stop them when they try to catch the League Trio, who at this point have developed a bond with all three characters. Even Brock gets in on the action since Nuxi, Mesprit and Azelf have a connection with all three. But the climactic moment is when they are trying to catch the League Trio, and there is no, there, this show isn't without consequences. When they're fighting at Lake Valor, and it looks like Hunter J has captured the Lake Trio, the Lake Trio fought back and destroyed her ship, sending her plummeting into the ocean, and she's died. Hunter J falls into the ocean, her ship explodes, she is never seen again. Despite, what the, despite the anime never mentioning it, Hunter J is dead. It's one in a few times there is a legit death, a death of a villain. It's it's a huge moment. They dwell on it for a moment, but then they kind of brush it off. But honestly, one of the most exciting moments there is. This arc, although it's only three episodes long, this three episode climactic arc to Team Galactic is one of the best things there is. Okay, I know people will talk about Team Flare more, but this was way better than Team Aqua and Magma. Like I said, Hold's basically a lesson of how to make Sinnoh better. Speaking of people, I did say Gary showed up, which was great because it was foreshadowed at the end of Battle Frontier. He shows up a few times when Hunter J's around, but that's about it. He didn't do much other than just, yo, know, being an assistant to Professor Rowan. I tell you was a huge missed opportunity. We know Gary's here. What would have been cool is, could you imagine if Gary and Paul met? That would have been so cool to have Ash's former rival and Ash's current rival meet. But they never do. It would have been so cool to have Gary meet Paul. It would have been, would have been one of the better things to do. But it never happened. So, oh well. Speaking of rivals who end up being forgettable, we have Kenny. Kenny is helpful in giving some more backstory and humor to Dawn. He's also a bit of shipping. You know, he explains Dawn's nickname. But other than that, he's forgettable. He doesn't win too many contests. He's lost to Jesse. He's lost to Zoe. He loses in the first round of the Grand Festival. But other than some shipping, he doesn't do much. He seems, he's one of those rivals which seem like they're going to be a big deal at the beginning. And they kind of just fall off until the Grand Festival. This happens with a few characters. Speaking of people who you didn't even think would be a rival, we have Conway, who actually only had three major appearances. He was in the tag battle, he was in the summer camp, and then he was in the Pokemon League. That being said, I like that the Pokemon League used a lot of cool characters we'd already seen. And Conway, being the calculating person he is, is a great character in the Pokemon League because he uses real strategies that you'd see in the games like Shuckle using Power Trick or uh, Dust Noir using Trick Room. 
But then we have Zoe, the main contest rival. And she doesn't feel like a big rival like Drew. But she does show up and she's more like, she shows up a lot like Paul. But instead she's more of a mentor to Dawn. And ultimately the person who beats Dawn in a grand festival. But unlike Drew, they do have a climactic battle. Even if she never, wi Dawn never wins. The climactic battle with Zoe is still great. And Zoe's at least somebody who shows up a lot. And that's one thing I'll compliment. Sino. The characters show up a lot, and although some of them kind of fall off in the middle, the fact is, there's always characters popping up. There's always little mini arcs happening. We often stick around in towns for multiple episodes, because rather than having lots of filler, the episode makes the show makes sure to drag out gym battles or climactic arcs, because it knows it's got four seasons to do this in. So, we do have the Ouroburg gym, where Ash loses, but one thing I like is, this is Ash learning a strategy. He learns a spin dodge strategy from Dawn. It's also the first time we get to see Paul in a gym battle. It's crazy to think we have an entire episode devoted to a rival doing a gym battle. We have a Turner City, which the gym battle there, not very memorable because Ash already lost to a Turner, lost to Gardenia. The only climactic thing is that Gardenia later becomes involved with James when... James gives away Cacnea to her for no reason. It's to learn Drain Punch. And then even when Cacnea learned Drain Punch, it, she, he never went and got it back. It was a cheap way to get rid of it. One of the better releases, at least, was Dust Tox, which was basically Bye Bye Butterfree, done better because it's with Jesse and Dust Tox. You know, plus we've seen Dust Tox a lot more, so Dust Tox feels like a great character, whereas Butterfree only had 20 episodes. So, yeah, Dust Tox's release was just bye bye Butterfree, done way better. Then you've got Heart Home, and the running joke is that it takes forever to get to the Heart Home gym. You show up in Heart Home at the end of season 10. And it's not there. And it takes an entire season before we get to battle. The only highlight is it does get Ash to learn a counter shield to stop the sleep. And at least counter shield, again, another cool idea that Ash uses. So again, I like that Ash actually tries cool different weird strategies in this season. But one thing, the only thing I thought about with Fantina is her character. Take a look at Fantina, then go look at Tucker from the Battle Frontier we saw last season. Don't they look very similar? They have the same hair, they have the same face shape. Tucker is a performer who loves the fame and is very much into contests, just like Fantina is a gym battler who's also into contests. They look the same, they even have the same face shape. Even when I was a kid, I thought it was odd that Fantina had what typically looks like a masculine face shape, even though they're female. You could just see it even in the games. They have the same matching face shape. So, are Fantina and Tucker related? Or perhaps, is Fantina just Tucker after a transition? There's my joke theory for you anyway. Something to think about. Another arc that I have good and bad feelings on, is the Wallace Cup. As per usual, we have to have the tradition of the previous companion coming back, so we get May back for five episodes, and I'm always happy to see May back. I've missed her. She has her Glaceon, which her Eevee evolved. She has great chemistry with Dawn and Zoe, and they all participate, Ash, May, Dawn, Zoe, Jesse, they all participate in the Wallace Cup, which is basically, it's a bit like a grand festival, but not. But the thing is, you still win a ribbon. At this, but here's a downside. At this point, Dawn had had a really shit run of contests. Only won one ribbon, and lost three, possibly four, contests at this point. And yet... Dawn beats May. Yes, you heard me. Dawn, the person who has won one ribbon, beats the person who has won 13 ribbons and participated in two grand festivals. How the hell does Dawn beat May? Look, I get it. She's the protagonist for this season. Dawn's got to get a ribbon. She's got to improve. But why? Why? How does that even make sense? Dawn should not be able to beat May, especially not this early into the journey. Yeah, maybe if it was like literally at the end of the journey they had a cool battle, but no, it's in the middle of the journey when Dawn has had a huge losing streak. 
Uh, speaking of Dawn's losing streak, a cool idea we got was when Dawn tried to participate in the Veilstone Gym to cheer up Maylene, and it was a good way to have both cheer up Dawn and cheer up Maylene. But the Veilstone Gym, probably the most memorable gym battle, because it was Buizel versus Lucario, and that was a climactic battle. Go watch that battle, it was a good battle, one of the few memorable Sinnoh gym battles in my mind. The only other thing about Veilstone City is we get introduced to Paul's brother Reggie, who, it's basically, you know, he's the kind of version to Paul, and the thing is, like Paul, he's participated in a lot of gyms, and Reggie has even done a Battle Frontier, the only difference is Ash could do the Pyramid, whereas Paul and Reggie couldn't. Then we have Pistoria. Another gym where I can't think of a memorable moment at all. It's so quick, it's so forgettable. Ash doesn't even lose a single Pokemon. The only other thing is we have this dumb Kroger festival. A arc I did like, which don't, it's technically filler if you want to call it that, but it's four episodes long, is the Summer Academy arc or whatever it's called. It's a great arc, we get to see Conway back, which is great because we get more development for him, we get to have lots of fun goofing around moments, it's a bit like, it's a bit like Sun and Moon, except it's only four episodes long, and I like the episodes where they just kind of hang out in the same location, and it's nice to see them having fun in a school environment, and we get introduced to a nice side character for Angie, which means more shipping for Ash, but hey, the Summer Academy, although Angie's kind of like Annabelle. Ash mistook her. What is it with P Ash mis not knowing people's gender and then that person liking Ash? Do androgynous people just have a thing for Ash? Speaking of other rivals, we have Barry, who, on one hand, he's an incredibly faithful character because he's exactly the way he is in the game, spot on. And although he's a rival for Ash, he's actually a rival for Paul. He doesn't even have much of a climactic battle with Ash. Barry instead has a climactic battle with Paul, and that's what's exciting. But other than that, Barry comes off as annoying, which, to be fair, I suppose that's what happens. If you took the game character and put him in the anime, he'd be annoying. We did have the Carnalave gym, and the only exciting thing there is you could see Rourke versus Byron, and like I said, it's nice to see characters pop up again. We do have a, another rival who... It's a bit like Harley, except it's a girl, so I suppose it's Harley, but it's not nearly as exciting as Harley, it's just Ursula. The only thing is, she, it, she's there to help expose a old side story with Dawn's nickname, we get some plus or minor, although she is a really good performer, she had a really cool routine in the Grand Festival, where she evolved two Eevees at once in the stage by using a water and fire stone. That is how you do a performance. That is banking it, saying, I'm going to save me stones for the Grand Festival. And knowing that, that's also clever, because you really have to know how to work on the spot, because once those easy use evolve, they can't train. That's how you bank a performance. But other than that, Ursula's just Harley, because she's always trying to manipulate people. But other than that, she's not as good as Harley. You do have Snowpoint City, which does have a long arc, because first you got the battle with Candace, which was kind of forgettable, although Candace and Zoe have a backstory. We do, we, we have a mini arc where Brandon from Battle Pyramid returns, so again, more continuity from the Battle Frontier, only this time Paul faces Brandon against his ass absolutely handed to him. So, just a reminder that Ash is the better trainer, because he could beat Paul, beat Brandon, and Paul never could. The only, the, uh, the last thing is Brock sees Yuxi, and then they have a huge battle at Link Acuity, where they have a 6-on-6 six -six battle, and Paul beats Ash, and then Hunter J tries to show up and steal the Reggies from Brandon. So, honestly, we do a lot in Snowpoint City. We, got, we jump from one major event with the gym battle to another villainous arc with Hunter J, to continuity with Brandon, to a climactic battle which gets brought up all the time. There's a lot that happens. We have the Twin Leaf Festival, which is just a handful of few episodes. Some of them are filler, some of them are fun, like Dawn versus her mother, Ash versus Barry's father, but not much happens there. 
We do like the Johto Festival where we have a handful of episodes where we have Lyra from Heart Gold and Soul Silver show up. Yes, it's the episode where they blatantly advertise the games, but I suppose they always have to do it. The only thing is Lyra is how Dawn gets her Cyndaquil, and that's about it. She doesn't have many other memorable moments other than, hey, here's Lyra, she ships people, she's annoying, but other than that, it's Lyra. What are you going to do? No one likes Lyra. She's not that great in the games. People prefer Crystal, and then here she is in the anime, and she doesn't have any memorable moments. It's just, oh, Lyra's here, I guess. Then we get to Sunny Shore Gym, which, ah, uh, wait, never mind, we don't get to Gym, because Team Rocket tries to steal a tower, a building. You heard me right, Team Rocket tried to steal an entire building. Don't ask how, but they did, and that interrupts a gym battle. Which means we have to wait half a season for the gym battle. When we finally do get to gym battle, it's a great battle because it's used as a climactic battle where Infernape finally masters Blaze right before the Pokemon League. So it was great. And I suppose, again, it's like the games where Flint's there and he tries to, you know, get the gym leader to have his old passion back. But other than that, it was a great battle because it was Infernape learning Blaze, and probably one of the more memorable Sinnoh Gym battles other than, say, um, Maylene. Then we get the Grand Festival. Possibly my favourite Grand Festival. We have great opening routines, we have a crap ton of rivals because you have Dawn, Ursula, Kenny, Zoe, Nando, and Jesse. And I already said that Ursula had a great opening routine with her Eevees. We get the shock with the fact that Kenny loses in the opening appeal round, which just shows how strong this Grand Festival is, but also shows how much Kenny actually sucks. And then we get some good and bad. We get an entire episode focused on Nando and Zoe fighting. The problem is... This episode takes up so much time that it doesn't leave room for Jesse and Dawn's battle. Now, this annoys me. Why are we spending more time focusing on two side characters battling than we are on two major characters? Obviously, Jesse was never going to win, but did they have to make it such a rushed battle? This was the last battle we're ever going to see Jesse do as a coordinator. Jesse has earned her way and has become a great coordinator and someone you really want to see do well. She's earned fame, she's had a spotlight, she deserved it. Of course she wasn't going to win, but could they make the battle a bit more even? Instead of making it such a one-sided battle where Dawn just completely destroys her? Uh, I did like the moment where Jesse lost and, you know, had some, res actually respects Dawn as a coordinator, which I really come to like, after both getting her ribbon from Dawn and, get and you know, losing to Dawn in a grand festival, she does have re some respect, although I, w w I will say, Dawn, you broke your promise to Jesse and didn't win the contest. D D Dawn doesn't win the grand festival, but... Holy hell, is it a climactic battle. That final battle against Zoe does come right down to the wire, and it's a huge battle. It takes up practically a whole episode. It's a huge battle. It goes back and forth. You really don't know. And honestly, you could have thought Dawn was going to win because it came right down to the wire, and it was one of those things where it's a last second standing and Dawn just barely loses by three seconds. But, Way better Grand Festival than we've ever had, although I wish they gave Jesse way more attention than freaking Nando. <sighs> Alright, time for the Sinnoh League, and one really clever thing I love is Ash does bring back his old Pokemon. Although, up until now, he's used all his Sinnoh Pokemon, in the Pokemon League, he uses all his Pokemon. Starting up, his Cyndaquil evolves, which is great, so now he's got a Quillava, which is used at one time. And he gets to use old Pokemon. But don't worry, they're clever in the fact that they save the Sinnoh Pokemon for the battle we care about, the battle against Paul. It's like, okay, we saved the Pokemon we've been paying attention to for the most climactic battle. And in all the other battles, we use the old Pokemon. So old ones get a chance to Stein, and the new ones get a chance to be great in the battle that matters. We get Ash versus Nando, which was just a bug on bug battle with Heracross, which was fun. We get Barry versus Paul, which Barry, he did alright, but he still didn't defeat a single one of Paul's Pokemon. But it did show Paul was starting to become a bit more spe respectful to people like Barry. 
Then you've got Ash versus Conway, which like I said, Conway was great. He used Shuckle and Power Trick. He used he used um, Trick Room, but then Ash caught him off guard by doing things like eating Shadow Punch. But that just shows the calculated cool ways of Conway versus Ash being completely insane, and it works. Then you've got the three episode long battle of Ash and Paul. Three episodes long, and yet it doesn't feel like it gets stale or drags on. This is a battle you've wanted to see for so long. Yes, Ash wins. It comes right down to the wire. Inferno finally masters Blaze, and after, you know, it's a three episode long battle, and you really feel like after four seasons of Paul, we've built to this moment. We've been waiting for this moment, seeing Paul finally get his ha ass handed to him by Blaze, the Chimchar he rejected and couldn't master. It was just the perfect climactic moment. You all wanted to see it coming, and it was great. One of the best Pokemon leagues. Then we talk about how Ash lost. People are annoyed that Ash lost to Bias. I'm not. I don't mind when Ash loses. That being said, although Ash loses to Tobias, I think a lot of people forget how well Ash did. Sceptile took down Darkrai, and Pikachu took down Latios. Pikachu can take down fucking legendaries. It destroyed Re Brandon's Regiice. It destroys his Latios. Yeah, Ash lost. And Tobias still had four Pokemon he'd never used. But Ash was the only person in the entire Pokemon to defeat not just one, but two of Tobias' Pokemon. Pikachu can take down legendaries, and that climactic moment where Pikachu does it, it's a climactic moment. It's exciting to watch. Yes, Ash loses, but doesn't bother me. What does bother me is what will happen with Pikachu later, but that's for another review. But, all in all, we reach the end. Dawn decides to be a coordinator again, Brock decides to be a doctor and they're both going to separate rays, and the ending just feels rushed. We have what feels like a filler episode to set up Brock becoming a doctor, and then we have just, you know, oh, we're in Twin Leaf Town. Oh, we're going to rush the fact that Dawn's going to, is she going to become a fashion designer? Is she going to stay a coordinator? Oh, I guess she is. Piplop's crying. What a wasteful last episode. And there is no... Transition. Normally you'd hear me talk about how there's a great transition between one region to another with foreshadowing and setup. There was none of that. There was not a single point in the anime was there a Unovan Pokemon. There was no mention of a new region. Ash never said where he was going. Although at least it's implied there is some time gap between this and the next region. But there is no foreshadowing. The only foreshadowing is the fact that Team Rocket got promoted. Because once again, Team Rocket said they helped take down Team Galactic. And this time, they technically did. They lied about Magma and Aqua, but this time, they legitimately did help. Not as to much as Ash, but they still helped with Looker. So, it paid off and Team Rocket got promoted, and that's the only thing that leads into the next series. Other than that, there's no transition, and we'll talk about what that means for the next series later on, but... Yeah... But, regardless, Sinnoh was great. It does feel like it dragged on a lot of times. Even if there wasn't always filler, it still felt like it dragged on at certain points. And certain characters like Dawn, Piplup, and other characters sometimes got on my nerves. And plus it's 200 episodes, so it's a lot. And it's hard to remember some of the better moments because they might get swept under the rug by other moments. But, easily, Sinnoh is one of the most well-crafted it does stretch on, but I can't, they did the best they could with the pacing considering it's four seasons long. Yes, Battle Frontier and Hoenn had way better pacing, but they were shorter in general. This was good pacing considering they had to do it for four seasons. That being said, it was still long, it was still four seasons. There were certain characters like Dawn who felt like they got more attention than they deserved. Piplup was annoying, other characters got annoying. But Ash, this was Ash at his best, Paul was a great rival, the Pokemon League and Grand Festivals were great, this is the best we'll ever see of Jesse, and it's a shame we're never going to see contests again. This is the last time we see contests, and it is such a shame, I wish they'd bring them back. I mean, Pokemon Journey should do an episode where all the contest coordinators from both generations come back, but that's for another story. But, 
All in all, Sinner, you're very well crafted, pretty well paced, all thing considering. Some characters I don't like, but hey, that's 200 of the episodes finally done and dusted. Next, we move on to the fifth generation, Unova, black and white. The, what most people regard as the worst. Do I think that? We'll just wait and see, but oh boy, do I have mixed feelings on black and white. But we'll worry about that next time. We will see you next time for when I review Pokemon Black and White, the anime. See you next time.